Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help. Lead to succeed. Picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed, episode 53. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Mike Michalowicz. Mike is the author of Profit First, Surge, The Pumpkin Plan, and his newest release, Clockwork. By his 35th birthday, Mike had founded and sold two companies, one to private equity and the other to a Fortune 500. Today, he is running his third multi-million dollar venture, Profit First Professionals. Mike is a former small business consultant for the Wall Street Journal and the former business makeover specialist on MSNBC. Over the years, Mike has traveled the globe speaking with thousands of entrepreneurs and is joining us today to share the best of what he has learned. Mike, Mike thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Natalia. It's my joy to be here. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And from one New Jersey native to another, actually, I, I tell people I grew up on a small island across the water called Manhattan. Not, every, <laughs> yeah. not everybody's heard of it. No, uh, no. Those, yeah. <laughs> but it's across a little tunnel that I think we both often transverse. Um, there's so much to unpack. And I, as I was sharing with you before our conversation, Mike, um, I'm a huge fan of your content. Thank you. The Pumpkin Thank you. Plan in particular, I, I, I know best. Um, there's so much to really get into here. But this last line of your bio is super intriguing. It's, it's a massive statement, but maybe you could distill it for us just in a few nuggets to get the conversation started. So you talked about how you're going to share the best of what you've learned. And I know you've traveled the world. I know you talk to people all the time. What is the best of what you've learned, Mike? Well, I learned that um, the traditional measurements of entrepreneurial success is not what drives entrepreneurial success. So uh, we as an entrepreneurial community, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life, it's top line thinking. You know, How big is your business? How many employees do you have? What kind of revenue do you have? And we can sell our way to success. And uh, I've tried that. Um, I've grown businesses, multi-million dollar companies, which from the outside for a small business sounds very impressive, but they were not operated effectively. I, they, I didn't understand cash flow. I didn't understand profitability. I didn't understand um, uh, actually managing employees. I thought, you know, have a big vision and play into that. And that's actually not true. It's have, understand the vision of every single employee, what their dream is and align their dreams to collectively achieve your dream. So it's just challenging the common notions, the measurements we see on the cover of Inc. Magazine and Fortune uh, of these successful businesses it's a top line thinking mentality. And, and I am, I've concluded that successful entrepreneurship is not a top line mentality. It's, it's in the crevices and approaching these ideas in a different, from a different perspective. Yeah. So that, that's, I love, by the way, anything related to what we might call contrarian thinking, or at least getting us to think yeah. differently about our work and about our businesses. And because leadership is my personal passion and my work, um, it's really important for me to hear perspectives such as this one. So let's, jump right into the crevices yeah. and give me a sense, Mike, of, of what you're talking about in a more specific and a more, let's call it tactical or tangible way that people sure. could say, you know, I, I get the fact that I need to think differently, but practically speaking, what does that look like? And what does that do? You know, sometimes the, the metrics are clear. Sometimes it's a little bit more gray. Let's call it human or soft skills. It's not always so yeah. clear and cut and dry. It's more of a messy process, but you probably, if I'm guess, if I'm understanding correctly, probably are thinking about a lot of different things that most leaders may not automatically assume will drive their success, but yet you have found consistently for yourself and with the people you support that these are drivers. That's right. That's right. So I'll start with one specifically because it's the most popular concept I have out there right now. And I devote every book I write, I devote to one of these concepts, these contrarian concepts. So Profit First is my most popular book currently. And what I realized was that the traditional teaching, which is in thousands of counting books and business books, and it's actually even in our common vernacular, teaches us that sales minus expenses equals profit. That profit is the bottom line or the year end. That's the vernacular that we use. And um, I read a study. I, I'm not sure of who the source was, but I know the SBA was involved, Small Business Administration. They identified that 83% of small businesses under $25 million in revenue are surviving check by check. And there's 180 million small businesses globally, 28 million alone in the US. And uh, what 
was confounding to me was how can so many business owners get all these elements right, marketing and, and sales and getting the word out, and yet we started a business for financial freedom, at least in part for that, and yet we can't achieve that? Like, what's wrong with us? And that's when I realized that formula that is pervasive is, is horrible. Because while it makes logical sense, you have to have revenue, you subtract expenses, the remainder is profit. I get it from a mathematical standpoint. But from a human standpoint, the behavioral standpoint, that's not how we operate. When we put something last, that's the same as saying it's insignificant. You know, I, I don't like my family, therefore I put them last. Like if you love your family, you'd say I put them first. Or yes. if you have a health scare, you don't say I'm going to put my health last now. You say I'm going to put my health first. So it's human nature. What comes first gets addressed. What comes last gets delayed at best, ignored at worst. And for most business owners, profit is only considered at the end of the quarter if they're lucky. Usually at the end of the year, it doesn't happen. And they say maybe next year. What I teach in profit first is a new formula. It's sales minus profit equals expenses. And what I'm saying in practice, every time we have income, a deposit come into our business, we immediately take a predetermined percentage of that money, 5, 10, 15, mm -hmm. 20, more, allocate that money toward profit, remove it from the business so the business mm -hmm. doesn't even have access to it, and run the business off the remainder. It's the pay yourself first principle applied to business. And um, I call it profit first. The result now is we, we have, we're aware of over 150,000, we think it's actually 200,000 businesses that have implemented successfully profit first. And it's this little contrarian thing that now works with human behavior. The, the, the most fascinating part is it's human behavior also to expand our consumption of something based upon its resource. Therefore, the more available something is, the more we consume. The more food I put on a plate, the more I will eat. Yes. You know, with money, the more that's made available to the business, the more we consume. And the traditional formula of sales minus expenses says all sales are available for expenses. And that's how we behave. In this new formula of profit first, we remove our profit first. Now there's a smaller plate of food for us to consume. There's a smaller amount of money. And we adjust accordingly. And it's not just forced frugality. It's also innovative thinking. How do you stretch your dollar? So businesses that do this um, are able to often achieve the same, if not better results with less money because they think more innovatively by taking the profit first. Wow. So I'm hearing, first of all, the richest man in, ba to ba in Babylon. Oh, totally. I'm yeah. hearing that. I'm hearing a leaving pieces of the pumpkin plan because you yep. talked there about frugality. Correct. And by the way, that's one of the, uh, that's, that's one of the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Justifiers in my own mind for sometimes not, you know, expanding my own workspace, which is not always um, as conducive perhaps, but I know that I can get a lot done. And so I put my resources elsewhere. So I often think about your description of the, the small office with the secondhand furniture or whatever it is. I'm not sure that that's still the case, but back yeah. in the day, I know it was. Um, but talk to me a little bit about, so now I've got this profit and I've set it aside. Are you saying that it's untouched and then it just goes into um, my pocket, so to speak, on the back end? Is there an element of reinvestment? And where does that, where do I draw? Anything I want to think about using money towards furthering the business itself? Is that coming out of your 80% or is that out of that 20%? No, it comes out of the 80%. And, uh, and I'll talk about reinvestment and why it's a very dangerous term because that's common vernacular, plow back, reinvest, push back. So what happens is, and it is uh, the pay yourself first principle from Richest Man Babylon, Think and Grow Rich. These principles have been around for eons. I'm just saying this doesn't apply just to personal finance. It translates to business finance. What happens in practice is we set up accounts at our bank. Uh, it's very important to do this, by the way. This is not a spreadsheet or an accounting system thing. It works with any spreadsheet. It works with any accounting system. But we need to intercept our natural behavioral path. For physical fitness, if you want to start working out, um, Put your gym shoes on top of the toilet seat in your bathroom because when you wake up in the morning to use the bathroom, you are forced, you intercept uh, those, those sneakers and you're more likely to put them on and actually go to the gym. Well, with Profit First, we're going to set up a profit account in your bank. So when money comes into a, an account, we call it the income account, now the money is there to be divided up to these different purposes. And Profit's just one. There's other things. We have to distinguish what Profit is. Profit is not compensation to the owner operator of the business, the person working in the business. Profit is compensation to a shareholder, which can be distinct people. Usually it's the same in small business, but I own stock in Ford. I'm not like a heavy investor. I own hundred shares and uh, Ford sent me a check. I'll never forget $13 and 23 cents. When I got this check, I didn't say, Oh my gosh, I don't deserve this. I got to return it to Ford in a reinvestment or plowback. No, I said, I'm a shareholder. I took risk. 
the valuation I hope goes up or may go down, seems to be recently. And uh, therefore they're rewarding me for taking on that risk. So this is my money. And, and I didn't say I have to go to Ford and you know, work the line for, uh, for a little bit to earn this money as an employee. I said, no, I'm a shareholder. We are all shareholders in our small business. So the intention of profit is to reward you for taking the risk of making a significant investment. Many of us own upwards of 100% of our own business or 50%. It's a significant tranche of our investment in our business. And I also want to realize, our, our listeners to realize is that as starting a small business, you are a provider for your, your family, but also our community, your employees, uh, our cities, our world, our collective world is being supported by you. Only 7% of people on this planet will ever own or, or uh, be entrepreneurs of a business. So the profit is a thank you for taking extraordinary risks. Your valuation may go up or go down. Therefore, the, account, the money in the profit account gets distributed for a singular purpose, to reward shareholders. Now, there are unique and extreme circumstances, but the golden rule is that money is used to reward the shareholder. And therefore, the distribution comes to you as the owner of the business, we do it on a quarterly basis because that's what big companies do too. That's good fiscal discipline. And that money is, is for you to use in any way that you see as a reward. You can go out for an amazing dinner or vacation. You can pay off personal debt. You can fund your college education or your children's, whatever it is. If you reinvest or plow back, I want you to be very careful about those terms because what that says is it's really not a profit. We called it profit for a period of time, but now we've put it back in the business. The business has spent the money. We need to really clearly bifurcate what these terms are. Profit is a reward to the shareholder or it's retained, retained money that will ultimately be provided to the shareholder. That's what profit is. When money is spent by the business, that is an expense. We, we play this soft term though, and I was doing a lecture on this um, recently and this entrepreneur came up to me. She came up to me and she said, uh, I watched your profit first presentation. I loved it. She goes, but I don't need this system. And I said, that, that's great. I, I assume you have a very profitable company. She said, extremely. We posted a 22% profit last year. I'm like, that's, that's remarkable. That's among the fiscally elite. Congratulations. I said, what'd you do with the money? She goes, oh, we reinvested it. And that's when red flags start going off for me. I said, well, what do you mean you reinvested? She goes, well, I took all that money and put it right back into the business. I said, what'd the business do with it? She goes, we spent it. We bought equipment. We hired more people. And I looked at her and I said, I, I got to be very candid with you. That is not profit. It is an expense. If you're hiring people and spending the money, that's an expense. But you are playing a shell game. You put it in a profit account or you held it aside temporarily. So on an accounting basis, it feels good. But the money's evaporated. You can't use it for shareholders. So I said it's an expense. And when you're that clear, when it's that black and white, we run our business more effectively. It's kind of like someone saying, I'm a little fluffy. No, the better term is you're overweight or you're obese. But we use these soft terms of saying, I had profit, but not really because I reinvested. That means you had no profit. Profit so is only recognized on the distribution or retention. Sorry. Account. Yeah, no, that's great. So where would, where would actual salary um, or just my own takeaway as the owner, is that an expense the way you're defining it? Well, it's an expense, but in profit first, we categorize it as owner's compensation. So it's another account. That's a third so category. A third category. So there's at your business, there's ultimately, we call it the five foundational accounts. Income is what is a depository only account to recognize the inbound cash flow. We then allocate based upon percentages to profit, owner's compensation, which is different, tax to pay for the taxes of the owner, and then operating expenses which for the operations of the business. Here's the thing about owner's compensation. If you own a business, likely you're an owner operator and you're probably the best employee the business will ever have. I mean, you're a devotee to the business yes. and we need to pay you accordingly. <clears throat> Many business owners defer their own compensation, start to resent their business as they pay for everyone else. So we're going to allocate money to this owner's comp. Owner's compensation is to support your lifestyle. So you adjust your lifestyle back home to live off of your normalized salary out of owner's comp. Then every quarter, you're now getting a bonus check, which is the profit distribution. This is not to support your ongoing life. We need to adjust our lifestyle to live with an owner's compensation, a reasonable salary. It's to experience life in any way you define it as a bonus. That's mm -hmm. why we clarify. And, and OPEX, by the way, is the lifestyle, if you will, of the business. This is what the business needs to adjust to. I love the idea of Intercept because I think what it does is it forces us to take some kind of definitive action. It, right. it says, this is important to me. I'm going to make sure whether it's putting it on my calendar, putting it physically in front of me. You know, sometimes I'll put something on my car seat if right. I want to like remember it and make sure I take action on it. It's, it's just creating 
triggers because we have such a distracted life. You know, uh, I'm active on social media. I've got a blog, a podcast, so many ways where I'm interacting with people, of course, my clients and everything that I do and my family and everything that's really important as we talked about before. So if I don't put elements of interception, so to speak, in front right. of me and create that framework, a lot of stuff's just not going to happen. So that's There's one thing that I love. Yeah, yeah, thank you for saying that. There's a great book called The Power of Habit by an author, Charles Duhigg, I think his name is. Basically, the <clears throat> concept I learned from that book is take the subconscious and make it conscious. So we often, because we're so distracted, living at a very subconscious level, the decisions are being made, but we're not bringing it to a cognitive level. When we have an intercept in our path, we now have to make a decision, like a landing page. I have to cognitively click off. Um, if the gym shoes are sitting in my toilet seat, I have to cognitively pick them up and then put them back on the shelf and say, I'm not going to do this today. So yeah, it forces yeah. those decisions. Right. And I think the whole idea, like you talked about bringing things to the conscious level, you know, some of our most powerful thinking happens on the subconscious, but we do need to train it. We that's do exactly to right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, you know, you mentioned thinking grow rich. So that's obviously a powerful tenant there. There's a mastermind group that I'm part of right now. And anyone who's not part of one or not part of any type of group learning oriented group, I strongly encourage you to be doing those kinds of things because we're always better and stronger and more wis you know, wiser and more knowledgeable when we bring, you know, others together besides for the support and the encouragement that it provides. Um, but I'm working on my, um, a purpose statement right now over a relatively finite period of time with a financial goal and with some other pieces. And I, I write it out, not always as religiously as I should, but minimally I read it every day, twice a day. And I, I typically it. write it out as well because it's taking the subconscious, Mike, and it's bringing it, you know this, bring it to that next level where now my brain has to think about how am I going to solve this, you know, this BHAG, this big, hairy, audacious goal that I've created yep. and make it a priority for me. So it's not just in the back of my mind, something one day I'd like to do. It's bringing it front and center and forcing me to take action around it and, and, and sort of strategize. I, I feel compelled to show you something, Naftali. Let me just pull this off my screen, off my wall here. Um, I have my purpose statement I do this every year. This is my 2019, as you can see it, but all my goals with my life's purpose statement down below. And um, what I found when it comes to a life's purpose statement is that it, it brings a, uh, an element of energy or drive that I think keeps positive momentum going. I believe most entrepreneurs and how I ran my life forever was, I call it the survival trap. Whatever circumstance I was in today, I wanted to get out of it. You know, I wasn't making enough money. I need to sell more. And I was very much running away, if you will, from, from negative circumstances, but every decision I was making on a daily basis would move me in a different direction. Sometimes it was more sales. I need to hire someone. I need to fire someone now. And so I started doing this pattern, became very circuitous. I then realized that once I had a life purpose, it now becomes a filter. And my life's purpose, my big hairy audacious goal is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. That's how I put it succinctly. It's this gap of what we believe entrepreneurs are experiencing, wealth and freedom of time and the reality, which is no money and struggle. Yes. I want to close that gap. And, um, with purpose, every decision I make, including our discussion right now, is am I filtering it to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty? If not, it's not something appropriate for me to do. If so, it keeps marching me down this path. That's the power of purpose. Yeah, that is so powerful. And um, just in the interest of, of adding some other elements to our conversation, I'm going to pivot to another question in just a second. But since you did put it up on the screen, I'm going to ask your permission if you're willing to share it, because I think that oftentimes... We talk about purpose statements, we talk about other things, but if we see them in action or we see them concretized, that it helps us to create our own. It sort of motivates us to do that. So yeah. think about it. You don't have to say yes on, you know, in our conversation, but if you're willing to share that so that others can sort of learn from it. Totally. Examples I, of, I may just yeah. lead some very personal elements, uh, like relationships. Obviously. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, sure. Yeah, but I, I think it's a powerful way to do it. Um, I've been doing it yeah. for years it works. The, the funny last element about it is I'll set some goals that I won't even really put much more conscious thought into over the year. And then when I do my end of the year summary, sometimes I cross golf. I'm like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot I was trying to achieve that. It just, I motored right through it. So it's yeah. powerful. 
Now, you sound like you're a very disciplined person. I have no idea, but it certainly comes across that way in terms of being very mindful of the things you need to do and sort of cross-referencing against, you know, whether it's your profits in the various, you know, in the, in the various accounts or, or your goals and purpose statements and whatnot. Um, so I don't know if, if you need necessarily somebody else in your life to keep you focused on those things, but I know that I do. And, and I'm sure too. a lot of people listening do. So what do you recommend then, Mike, uh, for people who are, who need to do it, but maybe they're, like you said, they're sort of struggling to live in the moment, pay their bills and all of that, and sure. yet keep them focused on the big picture. Yeah. So I, it's funny. I, I wouldn't necessarily call myself very disciplined, um, but I, the way I execute per, is perceivably disciplined. I don't miss things. And it's not because discipline, it's because accountability. And but maybe I'm talking, you know, six of one, half dozen of the other. Maybe, maybe they're the same thing from a different perspective. But I have an accountability group. Right before we did this, I had my Friday accountability call. And what I've done is surround myself with people um, of a diverse background and uh, relatively diverse people. They're all in the entrepreneurial space, or mostly, I should say. Um, so we can hold each other accountable. The interesting thing is it's not the here's my goal for the week. Did I do it or did I not? And everyone, if I didn't do it, yells at me. And if, if I did, everyone applauds me. What we found is there's the power in inquisition. If I don't do something, my accountability partners are responsible for saying, hey, Mike, we're noticing a trend here. Um, you're not achieving this certain goal. Let's ask you why. What's happening at the unconscious level? And they're, again, they're trying to pull the unconscious to conscious. Uh, one of the big awakenings I had was maybe about five or six years ago, um, one person in the group said, Mike, I've heard you set goals that you haven't achieved repeatedly. And then I see a pattern in, of you of martyrdom. She goes, you, you actually almost feel relieved that you don't achieve something and you do the woe is me. And I never realized that. But sure enough, I was playing the martyr game over and over again. And when she brought this to my face, it was, uh, it was hurtful, which usually when it hurts, it means it's hitting a chord, right? Yes, it means it's truthful. Um, and so I was like, Oh my gosh. And that one statement from that one person in my accountability group opened me up to uh, when I'm slipping or when something's not getting the outcome I want, my responsibility is actually to take ownership over that at a greater level and turn up the heat, not to say, woe is me. So th that's how I've been able to kind of keep momentum growing and going. Accountability groups are powerful. Yes. And my next question then is like a perfect segue uh, from from that point to the next one, and that is as follows. You know, we talked about entrepreneurs that struggle. Excuse me, uh, entrepreneurs that struggle, and oftentimes the reality is that we 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 need guidance, we need support, we need all of that. But you're an example of somebody who, at a very young age, as I detailed in in, in the introduction, you know, achieve great success. Yeah. So my question to you is, how does a person like you, or what advice would you give for somebody who's young? and successful to stay hungry because the reality is at a certain point, we don't need the money anymore. You know, yeah. it's not the financials that necessarily drive us. There are plenty of people who could live just fine over the successful million dollar businesses and all of that. Yeah. Um, but yet we're, we still have so much life left. We, we, we're interested not just in probably, uh, you know, moving off to some deserted island or, you know, place where we could just sort of enjoy right. beautiful sunsets every single day. We want to continue to give and to drive. What motivates you to keep going? And yeah, so... Yeah, so it's funny. My next book I'm I'm releasing in 2020. It's called Fix This Next. If you're curious, but this next we're book, gonna have to uh, talk again at that point. Okay, well, yeah, I, I would be honored to. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'd be honored to. I've discovered there is a hierarchy of needs for entrepreneurs, very similar to Maslow's human hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. the base level being physiological. We need air, water to breathe. Um, and the highest level in his map is self actualization, living into our purpose, which we yes. talked about. Yes. But he also pointed out that at any given moment, if a base need's not being served, we will automatically revert to serving that base need and prioritize it over the higher needs. So if we're talking, we can be self-actualizing with the best in the world. But if, you know, if I'm eating a hamburger and I start choking on the hamburger. Uh, that's priority. I, yeah, that's priority. It's, it's can you help me dislodge this or, or I'm dead? Well, the entrepreneurial hierarchy is the same. Financial stability is one of those components and I've lived with it and I've lived absolutely without it. I've blown all that money I made in, in my early days and really went through a dark depressive period. Um, once you have financial stability, some entrepreneurs I've discovered 
decide that's their exit. I'm going to go golf every afternoon and hang out on that deserted island uh, in the evenings. Above that, I found there's two levels. There is a level of which I call impact. Impact is where we realize we are not a transaction with our clientele or customers. We are transformational to them. That's where we start in giving them something beyond the product or service, that, that they become part of the community. So that's the impact level. Um, and that's where you start wielding influence. And as a choice, you can wield influence in a negative way or a positive way, an empowerment, empowering way. And any business can do this. You could, you could sell toilet paper and you could be a transformational business, maybe around environmental concerns and so forth. The highest level is legacy. And what legacy is, is where, uh, in, in my definition, is where the business now uh, is the one that transcends time and it's irrelevant of the owner. This is the point, and I've come to realize this, is you and I, we are not business owners. We are simply stewards of our business. There is a moment that the business is more significant than we are. And we were a cog in the wheel. We played a significant role to get us there, but we now have to play a more significant role of removing ourselves. And um, I like to pick on big companies because we know their names. If I ask you who the founder of Coca-Cola is, I strongly suspect you don't know. And I don't know either. I, I know it wasn't Dr. Pepper, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know um, who founded it. And that is the definition of legacy. The business, and I would believe the, the leadership team feels that Coca-Cola is doing a good thing. Uh, they bring maybe moments of joy and so forth. I understand there could be negative connotations around a product like that, but they think they're doing a good thing, I, I hope. But they've achieved legacy. That brand has lived on and on. Um, and I think that is the realization us as small business owners have to achieve, that there is a certain point we, where we are, we realize we're a steward and our responsibility is to give life to our business beyond our active input, hopefully into perpetuity. Yeah, there's so much power in that. Um, <clears throat> I, I like though, actually, what, what I should say differently, what really resonated with me was something you said earlier. First of all, I actually just um, released an ebook called, um, well, well, boosting your, your leadership impact or how to boost your leadership impact. And I focus on the three I's, which are integrity, influence, and impact. Love and it. so I have the continuum a little bit differently. You went from impact to influence. Mm -hmm. I move from influence to impact, but I see them really as many ways interchangeable. Mm -hmm. um, but either way, the idea of transformation to me, it, it, it goes beyond. So I think of like, why is Tony Robbins still in business? Right. right? Not be, not, not why should he be like he's doing something wrong, but right. why is he, if you're making billions of dollars and you've done this for so long and right. your work is intense, right? It's right. not like he's sitting there, you know, swinging from a hammock and sharing a little bit of wisdom. I mean, the dude is working, you know? Oh my gosh. Just, and I would argue in the model as I share it, it's he's at the impact level. He is transforming lives. There's no yeah. question about it. I, I've yeah. actually gone to his day of destiny and so forth. And it's, a, it's remarkable. I would I wonder if he's achieving the definition I gave to legacy. The day Anthony Robbins wraps things up or, or you know, leaves the business, it's not going to the business may be over. The, yeah. the funny thing is, on the flip side, there's another organization called Dale Carnegie. Well, Dale Carnegie, I think, lived in the early, I mean, the late 1800s, early 1900s, and also did similar stuff to Anthony Robbins, transformational stuff, but set the business up to live on without him. Now, the company continues to bear his name, Dale Carnegie, um, but the business continues to have this ongoing impact. And the thing is, I don't think either one's right or wrong. Um, yeah. I mean, li the journey of life is about the journey I, I ultimately have concluded. I do think there's an opportunity for us to decide about giving this longevity to our business. That's it. Yeah. I think that that's a powerful framework in which everything that we do should be, because I have the same issue. I was sort of thinking about it from my perspective, right? I'm, I'm in coaching. So... Mm -hmm what's what's to continue it after I hang it up, you know, that type right. of idea. So part of it is bringing in some other people and, and allowing the coaching work to be done in a more expansive level. But at the end of the day, if you can create some kind of turnkey, some kind of framework yes. around which people can then, they could add to it, they could supplement it, they could diversify around it, right? You think about McDonald's, you mentioned Coca-Cola, yes. all they have new offerings and new ways of packaging and marketing and all of that. But the core remains the same. The identity remains the same. And that's how it was established. So I I've think been, uh, all of I, us can, yeah. We're, we're I, I've been experimenting with McDonald's. So this is a quick little aside. When I go to McDonald's, and I do frequent McDonald's occasionally, uh, when I go there, I will ask the cash register person or whoever, hey, may I speak to the owner? 
I've in, not in one instance has the owner been there. And it's not like I have a complaint. I'm just curious to how they operate. The owner's not bake, booking, uh, making the burgers or, or the fries, and they're not right. in the little glorified closet they call an office. That's the store right. manager. The owner just comes in, collects the money. And that, that's the definition of being removed from the operation. They're living at the impact and legacy level. So yeah, quick yeah there's, there's a lot there. Um, actually, by the way, I forget the name offhand, but if you, if you really are interested in the name of the two guys, one who was the, um, I guess you would say the, the chief recipe or initial recipe creator, as well as the guy who bought it from him and really made the business out of it, um, in Think and Grow Rich, he actually tells the story of how Coke got started. So anyone who's listening and wants to get that information, there's probably faster ways to get it. Just Google <laughs> it. Uh, but if you want to hear it embedded in the story of, yeah. uh, of Think and Grow Rich, I would, I would certainly recommend that you get there. Now, I, I want to circle back, if I may, um, and probably wrap up this segment with this question. You, you alluded to something before where you talked about succeeding and then losing all of your money and the darkness of the time. So maybe you've already referenced it or maybe you're thinking about something else when I asked the question. But we all know that leadership is not just about success. It's about failure. But I saw a great quote yesterday. Now, unfortunately, I can't remember it verbatim. But the idea ultimately is that failure is not, in essence, failure is not failing as much as failure is when you, when you fail to get up, when you fail to mm, rise up from mm. the failure and take action. You know, so, so one of my biggest challenges, I was in school leadership before I transitioned into my work today. So my, one of my, my darkest moments had to do with when I was notified that I wasn't going to be renewed. It was a very challenging situation. Mm. And for that, with, without all the specifics involved, and I had a decision to make, what was I going to do with myself and with my future? Was mm. I going to continue on in school leadership? Was I going to try a different, a different path? And ultimately, this path sort of opened for me, and I've been blessed to be able to make a totally different kind of impact and have a very different kind of life on so many levels. Just the idea that here I am on a Friday morning having a conversation with you on a podcast when otherwise I'd be walking down the hallways and <laughs> checking disciplinary issues and visiting. Not that those aren't good things. No. But very different. And being bound to, an, to a building into a particular institution right so that failure let's call it ultimately was the springboard for my new my, my next chapter and so my question to you is mike what failure what challenge would you share with us that we can learn from and how did you learn from that and grow from that yeah so it's so clear and obvious for me it actually happened on february 14th 2008 and i'll never forget because that's the day i got a call from my accountant Two years prior to that, I had sold my second company. I sold two companies in a row, acquired by a Fortune uh, 500, self-made millionaire, early 30s. And um, I was full of arrogance and, and ignorance. I'm not too familiar with Yiddish, but I think the term is schmuck. Uh, I, I was really, uh, really arrogant and um, thought I had figured out all of what defines entrepreneurial success. Well, on that day, February 14th, 2008, my accountant called and said, it's our recommendation. You declare bankruptcy. I had evaporated all my wealth through, you know, trophies and nonsense and also starting a very bad business I was a angel investor, but I had no right to be in that space. I was clueless about what I was doing and I blew money left and right. My, uh, the turning moment, my daughter, actually I have a picture uh, from around that time frame. She was a little girl then. So there's the picture. I'm a big football fan. So they were wearing the football gear in this picture. My, okay. wife, my daughter. You see it? Yeah. I guess. Yeah, cute kid. Um, that's many years back. She, um, I had to look at her in her eye and tell her she wanted to go, she had to do horseback riding lessons. We, we lost our house. We lost our possessions. We lost everything. I couldn't pay for horseback riding lessons. Mm -hmm. My daughter, as I was telling her this at the kitchen table and I'm, I'm crying in front of my family. It's a very shocking moment too. If you're a child and your provider, your, in this case, your father has taken away all of what he's provided. It is devastating. Yes. She ran out of the room and I, I thought she was running away from me. Um, and I respected that because I wanted to run away from myself too. She ran to her bedroom to grab her little piggy bank. She'd been saving up to buy a horse. She ran back down to me with it and said, Daddy, I, I want to be the provider for our family. Wow. And um, that moment is a, is a devastating, darkest moment in my life. It's also the brightest spot of my life, which I, I suspect your experience, Naftali, is the same. Like, I, it opened up my eyes to that I had complete ignorance around what entrepreneurial success was. And it became the turning moment. It wasn't like the next morning I woke up and said, okay, I got this all sorted out. I went through depression for two years. Uh, I started to drink a lot. I, I don't like to drink that much, but I, I started to drink a lot as medication. 
but there was this seed that was planted saying there's got to be a better way and there's got to be a better path. And I, I declared, you know, I need to resolve this for myself and I'm going to do it as an author. Something I dreamed about, but never thought you could be successful necessarily doing it. But I said, I'm going to devote myself to it. And uh, it triggered me to become an author. And every book I've written, Profit First, Clockwork, is really a resolution to something I don't understand or didn't understand. I seek out the solution and then write about it. So that dark moment, listen, I don't wish it upon anybody because in the moment it is devastating. Um, in retrospect, it's the most enlightening phase of our life. So it's kind of strange. I don't ever want to be there again. Sure. But if I do, at least I have a modicum of comfort knowing that is, I'm being enlightened about something. Yeah, you hit your on point. So you get up and walk again. You know, you got to get on so many triggers. That's it's really powerful. You know, the fact that we wouldn't be having this conversation, I wouldn't have learned from you. Right. So your readers wouldn't have learned from you had you not done it. The the idea, I love the the problem based learning approach, which is the way I learn as well. I need I have a problem. I want to solve it. Now sometimes I'll do my. Dean Grazioni, uh, I hope I pronounced that right, but I'm in one of his programs right now. And he talks about the idea of sometimes it's not what, but who. So for yeah, example, yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't want to go ahead and say, how do I solve myself this issue, this issue, this issue, because ultimately it could take us too far afield and yeah. we're busy learning how to create a website and how to do this and how to do that. And we're not focusing on what, re what re we are really gifted or need to be doing strategically. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you need to find the who that could step in and do it for you and cut them a check so you could go back to what you need to be doing. But, but either way, I think most people, if they're really honest with themselves, will, will, will acknowledge that it's from our darkest moments. It's from our feelings of failure. It's from our feelings of, of, of not being there for the people we love, however that is defined, that is the springboard. Maybe not immediate. It might take us a year or two or whatever it is, but we will ultimately rise from that if we are focused and we're willing to, to sort of do the hard work and we're going to achieve great things from that really difficult moment. And, you know, my, my journey, while, you know, I may not have, have, have reacted exactly in the same way, but we all struggle and it takes time. There's no like immediate fix. But, you know, I mentioned Tony Robbins before and his, he talks all the time about his difficult upbringing and how that sort mm. of brought him to a better place. Everybody has that on some level. And I think if nothing else from our conversation, there's been so much that you've shared already, tons of gold from which to mine further. But the idea that any setback is really, you know, I often think of it, it's, it's a book I'd like to write one day called Setback to Comeback. You know, the, mm, I like that title. Moving yeah. From moving from, you know, where my challenge was, what was my comeback and how did that transform me to a level I never would have even dreamt, right? If you didn't have that setback, you would have continued probably, I'm just guessing, you would have continued on in your, you know, investment processes and maybe building a new business, but you never would have been the, the teacher, right? The influencer that you are today because you use that setback to reframe who you are and how you can make an impact in the world. And I think that is sometimes the biggest gift of setbacks is to really reimagine who we are, mm -hmm. sort of drawing a clean slate. And now I kind of propel forward from there. So, so that was a very powerful way of ending that first segment, a primary segment. I thank you, Mike, for, for your, your openness. Um, you, you allowing us to sort of get into your story and at the same time to admire the successes that you've, that you've achieved. So I'm going to pivot to what I call rapid fire. It's okay. a little bit lighter. The answers are shorter. So it's okay. usually like one word, one sentence, something like this. Here we go. The worst mispronunciation of your last name. Oh, can we use a filthy word? Uh, if it's embedded in some other ones, go ahead. Yeah. It's Michalashitz. <laughs> <laughs> you have that in the pumpkin plant. I'm pretty sure it's there. Yeah. yeah, I yeah my high school buddies, uh, my old high school buddies still like to call me that. I hear that. Okay. Um, the, the, the best or worst, you could pick either one, the best or worst advice you were ever given. Best advice was don't listen to the advice I'm about to give. It was from a coach. And he says the best advice for the question I was asking is actually asking the client. A lot of times people don't ask their clients. They ask outside parties what the client wants, but the client's wallet speaks the truth. A book you most often gift or recommend other than your own? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm really into giftology right now uh, by John Rule. And it's become a personal friend of mine. Fascinating book on the power of giving. Beautiful. 
And finally, a place with entrepreneurial spirit that most people don't know. Somewhere in the world where there's a lot of entrepreneurial stuff oh, going on. Like, most people, like I'll think of New York City. I'll think of Silicon Valley. Yeah, Jamaica. So I, I've spent years working in Jamaica um, uh, in the city of Kingston, Ocho's Rios, but not the resort areas, the actual city. Massive entrepreneurial drive there. Massive opportunity in that country too. Um, there's just some legislation that kind of blocks some opportunities, but huge entrepreneurial drive there. It's, it was unexpected for me. Wow. Okay. So I'm going to give the, the, the floor to you, so to speak, give you an opportunity to share a little bit more about what you do, how people can connect with you, you. learn more, all that good stuff. So uh, concisely, uh, yeah, I'm an author. I, I write books for small businesses specifically. I also used to write for the Wall Street Journal for years. I'm a podcaster and blogger. All that stuff is available, the book chapters, free downloads and so forth, all at my website, which is mikemichalowitz.com. Here's the deal. No one can spell Michalowitz. My wife still struggles with it. So it's, uh, it's Mike <laughs> Motorbike. That was my other more uh, tame high school nickname. I've never driven a motorcycle, by the way. That's the irony. But Mike Motorbike. If you go there, it forwards you to my website. Uh, you'll see options for get the tools. That will get you all the resources for free. Yeah, and we're going to link it up as well so people don't have to worry about spelling it. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it'll, be on the, it'll be in the show notes as well as your social media handles. And if you're not following Mike, you certainly want to get in and pick up on, on all of that wisdom because as you can see just from our very distilled conversation, there's tons of goodness that Mike is, is sharing on a daily basis. And I certainly, I, I look forward to learning much more from you and get, becoming better connected. And I'm sure my audience does as well. So before we let you go, Mike, please do leave us with one final life lesson that's just kind of kind of send us off with more inspiration. Yeah, so um, I just want to go back to that profit conversation we have. Here's the challenge or life lesson I want to give you. You can do this today and I, I will guarantee you'll have permanent profitability for your business. And I think that's, that's important because it allows us to bring about stability and giving and so forth. Go to your bank and set up just one additional savings account, call it profit. You can even notify them in advance that you're coming and have them prepare the paperwork. It'll, it'll take five, 10 minutes, but get to the bank, set that up. Step two is allocate 1% of your income to that account every time and you'll start achieving profits like never before. Okay, awesome. All right. Well, thank you again for making the time for our conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've been looking forward to it since it got scheduled. So uh, I'm, I know it's going to, it's, it's delighting me and I know it's going to delight everybody else. Thank you again for joining us on Lead to Succeed and continue to do great work. Thank you, brother. Take care. You got it. Bye-bye now. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Your feedback gives the show more social proof and encourages more folks to listen. 